we continue in our series in the book of Judges. Woodsheds, as we remember from last time, was a place where they stored the wood separate from the main building, whether it was a house or a store. A woodshed became a symbol of a place for discipline. And I think that is a after woodshed, but not really what I had in mind, but the only one I can find uh, that to try to give you the image. Peter Cartwright was an old time preacher. When he was 16, he got saved, not just a little bit saved, he got glorious saved. By his own words, Peter Cartwright, uh, in our language, would have said he was a wild child, but he got saved. God called him to preach, and he became a preacher evangelist. Now, he didn't have a lot of book learning, a lot of education, but he had a whole lot of common sense. But there was something unique about him. Cartwright, says an author by the name of James McGraw, saw nothing inconsistent with a good Christian thrashing of rowdies who sought to disturb his meetings, so long as it was done in a spirit of love. In other words, uh, he was known to sometimes at a tent meeting, if some of the younger people got out of hand, or sometimes some people his own age, or uh, he might take them to the woodshed. I don't necessarily recommend that type of ministry in 2024. I'm just saying that's how it was back in the day. Back in the day when it was known as the Western Frontier, and he embodied the spirit of the frontier. So the story goes, it's a true story, it goes like this, that he was holding a tent revival, and during his meeting uh, there at the uh, front, I guess uh, at the front of the tent, uh, there were these two young ladies, nicely dressed. They came in, uh, I would assume sat down on the bench, but their brothers who had escorted them there stood at the back. And as the preaching uh, reached a conclusion, he issued an altar call. They came forward uh, to, to pray or, or, or whatnot. And as he is there, there at the front, he just slipped his hand in his pocket, pulled out a peppermint uh, because his throat was sore. He wasn't feeling 100% probably uh, back in the day before they had microphones or lapel mics or things of that nature, he probably had to shout to be heard. And he had a booming voice. I can understand uh, if his throat was sore. Well, the, the girl suddenly began to go into what uh, a spasm type thing, uh, uh, an emotional uh, response, I guess, being carried away. Back in those days, in the 1800s, uh, uh, late 1700s or 1800s, uh, it was uh, called the jerk. So I don't know what we might call it now, but it was the jerk. Well, the brothers who had seen him put that peppermint in his mouth, he, they just assumed that he had given something to them and caused them to have this spasm. Oh, they were hot. I, probably interrupting the worship service. I've had that happen once or twice uh, in, in my time as pastor, thankfully not here, but in other places and other times. Um, so it's not a fun situation. And they threatened to beat him up. Well, he was not intimidated and he was not going to be deterred by that. So he slipped his hand in his pocket. He said, yep, I gave your sister the jerks and I'm about to give them to you. And they hightailed it out of there. Now, long story longer is this, the, all four of those young people came to know Christ as Lord and Savior. Now, like I said, I, that was a, a time very different than what we have today, uh, but he was known to practice a muscular evangelism and sometimes give people a woodshed moment that became a watershed moment or turning point. And that's what we find in the book of Judges. In Judges chapter 2 in, uh, in particular, if you have your Bibles and you want to turn there, as we had gathered uh, last time and looked at this, it's a moment where the Lord is holding the people of Israel to account. Their failure to pursue the conquest, their flagrant disobedience when they began to uh, play around with the idols and the uh, religions of the people of Canaan, and so there's a moment where uh, it's quite clear God is intervening. In the book of Judges, chapter 2, verse 1 and following, then the angel of the Lord, now that could be uh, an angelic figure, it could be uh, a person that God has called, like
have a prophet, or as many preachers and Bible teachers, myself included, I am more than comfortable saying that may be a, an appearance of Jesus in the Old Testament long before the virgin birth uh, at Bethlehem. Then the angel of the Lord came up from Gilgal to Bochim and said, I led you up from Egypt and brought you to the land of which I swore to your fathers. And I said, I will never break my covenant with you, and you shall make no covenant with the inhabitants of this land. You shall tear down their altars, but you have not obeyed me or my voice. Why have you done this? Therefore, I also said, I will drive them out. I will not drive them out before you. But they shall become thorns in your side, and their gods shall be a snare to you. So it was when the angel of the Lord spoke these words to all the children of Israel that the people lifted up their voices and wept. Then they called the name of the place Bochim, weeping. And they sacrificed there to the Lord. And when Joshua had dismissed the people, the children of Israel went each to his own inheritance to possess the land. It goes on in that same chapter, verses 20 through 23. And it came to pass when the judge was dead, because we see a pattern that begins, that they reverted and behaved more corruptly than their fathers by following other gods to serve them and to bow down to them. They did not cease from their own doings nor from their stubborn way. Then the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel. And he said, because this nation has transgressed my covenant, which I commanded their fathers and has not heeded my voice, I also will no longer drive out before them any of the nations which Joshua left when he died, so that through them I may test Israel, whether they will keep the ways of the Lord to walk in them as their fathers kept them or not. Therefore the Lord left those nations without driving them out immediately, nor did he deliver them into the hand of Joshua. So we talked briefly about the reality of a woodshed, that, that uh, discipline, Divine discipline is a real thing. There is a punitive side to it. There is a, a corrective element, yes. And then there is a providential side. That is, uh, God is using that to teach a lesson. God is using that to, uh, to bring ultimate blessing. Because God communicates who He is and what He expects. And who He is, He's holy and just and righteous, as well as loving and merciful and compassion. And we are to be and to do the same. Israel was to do that as well. And yet, obviously, like Israel, sometimes we fall into sin. We sometimes uh, turn uh, away from uh, following the Lord as we should. Sometimes we sidestep into sin, and then there are consequences. And so, yes, the Lord brings discipline upon us, but not because he's being hateful, not because he's being ugly, not because he's being mean, but because he loves us too much to allow us to continue to go down that path. And the Bible reminds us that when that moment, when that woodshed moment comes, then as we submit to the Lord and we humbly receive that from the Lord, the Bible teaches us for whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. Hebrews 12, verse 6. And also, the Bible says in Proverbs 3.12, My son, do not reject the discipline of the Lord, and do not loathe uh, his rebuke. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves as a father, the son, in whom he delights. What was true in the Old Testament is true for you and me in 2024. Now, we can't on our own uh, live holy and, and generate that. We have to have God, the Holy Spirit, living within us, transforming us. And so there is those times where that sandpaper is applied. Picture of the Lord as the, as the ultimate carpenter using various grades of sandpaper, uh, polishing and sanding until there is a, a smooth, high-gloss finished product. Now, if that's true with wood, how much more so our life we are being transformed. So there's a providential element to discipline. But our response to God's discipline, much like Israel's response, is important. We can, number one, deny it. No, 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 he's not talking about me. No, no, he's talking about, he's talking about them over there. Or, no, 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 that's not discipline. That's not what he means by that. And sometimes we try to deceive ourselves when we just really need to listen to what he has to say. Or we can decry it. We just refuse to agree with God. We refuse to recognize it. Just, I'm not going to talk about it. There have been some things that, that if I just don't really want to go into the detail, I just don't want to deal with the subject matter, I have to, I'm just, I'm not going to go there. 
You know, this is how it is, and I'm just not going to go there. When I had students, oh, my word. The, 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 you were thought when I was handing grades out and tests, that the, the negotiations were open and diplomacy would reign. Now, Brother Moore, let us sit and let us reason together. Aha. Uh -huh. No, no, here's how, how it's going to be. I'm not discussing it. This is what you did. This is what you earned. Now, I will be more than willing. Uh, I never drop grades. I believe you earn what you get. And I'm not trying to get into classroom mode, but let me just for a moment, I say you, I told him, I said, you earn what you get, which is why I give you so many of, uh, well, it really wasn't a quiz, it wasn't a test. When you have a quiz that's 25 to 50 questions, some might consider that a test, I don't know. So we called them quests. I said, you get so many of those, I said, you have no excuse not to pull the grade up. I said, so look at it as a learning opportunity. And invariably I'd have the, the joker or two that would uh, goof off in class and I would bring the hammer down and, and I'm like, no, I'm not going to paddle you. I'm not going to do that. I said, but you're going to, I'm going to get you where it hurts. I said, break time. You're with me in the library and I got out Strong's Concordance, you know, the big thick book. If they were my Old Testament class, I took them to the Hebrew section where it has translated, has the Hebrew, has the English, well, the, what is known as the transliteration. In other words, what you can't read is an alien language that you can't read in the, the, uh, the English version, plus the definition and some other little nice little vowel and uh, pronunciation guide points. So I said, you will start here, let's just say the letter, uh, the one that looks kind of like a weird X, Aleph, is actually technically like an A and is sort of sometimes silent. And therefore, you start there until the bell rings. Enjoy. Brother Moore, I'm sorry, but that's the consequences. You yeah, okay? I said, look at it. I said, but you're getting to learn something. I said, because if you pay attention to those definitions, I said, you might learn a thing or two about your Old Testament. And if they were in my New Testament class, I'd pull the same thing out. I'd sometimes make copies and, and hand it out and say, start writing. I said, you know the drill. And it would be in Greek. You'd have the Greek, then you'd have the transliteration, then the English word, definitions, pronunciation guide. And I said, guys, I said, just look at it. I'm not punishing you. I said, because really, I said, I'm punishing myself. By I said, I want my coffee too, people. I said, so the faster you write, the faster I get my coffee. And we're all good. We're good, good. I said, but look at it. I said, I'm teaching you. I said, that's what discipline is about. Learn from this. Some of those didn't repeat that. Uh, they, they, they learned and, and went on. They didn't appreciate what they learned, maybe, but they didn't do that again. Sometimes we despise it. We just get a bad attitude and we reject it. We reject God. We resist it. And as a result, God turns up the heat and he brings down the pressure until we do. Or, better yet, we can derive some good from it. Allow it to have its perfect and practical work as it conforms us to the Lord's image. As, as we repent, that means we agree with God and we stop going in our direction and go in his direction. Changing the way we think, changing the way we feel, changing the way we speak, and changing the way we act so that we are now in line with the Lord rather than deviating from Him. Charles Spurgeon said, I bear my willing witness that I owe more to the fire and the hammer and the file than to anything else in my Lord's workshop. I sometimes question whether I have ever learned anything except through the rod. When my schoolroom is darkened, see most, end quote. So just kind of to bring you up to speed where we've been, now, where are we tonight? I want us to look at the reflections about woodshed moments. So the first one is that woodshed moments are often necessary. You know, our Heavenly Father, who is just and holy and righteous, He expects us to be and do the same. The Bible says, Be ye holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. That's not just, well, that was the Old Testament. That's not now. You and I are made holy in Christ, and there is a participatory uh, thing. We, we have a choice to make to live God's way and to incorporate God's Word into our life and to live it out. And when we don't and we deviate from that, then there are problems. We participate by faithful obedience. The Bible tells us, Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if, you, but if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many are as led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children and heirs... 
and the heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. Romans 8, so when you connect that back to Proverbs and Hebrews, then if we are a child of God, we should expect that the Lord will discipline us. There are times where it's a punitive thing. God has called me uh, on the carpet before when I've had a bad attitude, but also a providential, a, a learning experience because it is necessary because we're, we're meant to be moving forward. If we stand still and stagnate, ultimately we are declining. When we deviate, he corrects us. And the correction may be gentle. There are times God says, you know that's not a right thought. You know you shouldn't have said that. And I go and I apologize. Or, or I, I try to make right what I've done. Or, or do what I should have done in the first place. You know, Lord, I'm sorry. That was a, I, that was a terrible attitude I had at Walmart. Uh, or, you know, like today, like I, I, I want to eat my food away from everybody. I don't want to sit at the picnic table. Um, I don't do picnic tables. I just like my privacy. But, you know, nobody was forcing me to sit at the picnic table. I was able to go with my wife, and we sat at the table, just the two of us, had a nice, cozy, quaint little time, you know. But my first thought was, really? Seriously? You know, I come all this way to have to sit at the picnic table. Nobody was making me do nothing. So I said, Lord, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I said, maybe I'm a little hangry, <laughs> so I want my food, you know. And they finally brought it, and everything was nice again. But then sometimes, God's discipline may be intense. Just as the situation or the condition warrants. Jim Benison said it best. God will deal with us as gently as he can or as harshly as he must. So let's apply that. Let's be thankful that we have a Heavenly Father who chooses to correct us because he does so out of love. I'm not talking about judgment. Judgment is for unbelievers. I'm talking about the discipline of God. That he chooses to correct us when we falter, when we deviate, so that we do not remain deviant in our spiritual life. And so the woodshed moment can become a watershed moment. And then number two, woodshed moments are really an assessment when you think about it. Just like with the people of Israel, so with the church, and even in our own private individual lives, our motives are laid bare, our methods are laid bare before the Lord, our actions are laid bare, our attitudes are laid bare, our words and our works are laid bare before the Lord. And sometimes we are headed in a willful, particular, and prideful direction, and we think we're right. Been there a time or two. I'm sure if I were to ask for a show of hands, I'm not. But if I were, if we were honest, well, all hands would probably go up at some point. You know, the thing, I am right and I'm justified by this. Only realize, well, okay, I might be justified in the subject, but if my attitude is ugly, then I'm not being Christian about it. So I've already failed the test. So, so there are times where, you know, we have to bring it to the Lord. The Lord, you know, I'll lay it before you. And if there's something wrong with it, show me. Teach me. Change me. Because we must hear the truth as it is, not how it might be, not how we wish it would be or that it could or would be, but as it is. No room for excuses. No room for explanations, but extreme ownership. I'm sure that Israel would have loved to have argued and negotiated with God when the angel of the Lord was uh, present in that woodshed moment at Bokim. But he didn't give them that opportunity. This is how it is. This is the truth. It's laid bare. But he that doeth the truth coming to the light, that his deeds may be manifest, that they are wrought in God. John 3, 21. And Jesus cried out and said, He who believes in me, believes not in me, but in him who sent me. And he who sees me, he sees him who sent me. I have come as a light into the world, that whoever believes in me should not abide in darkness. And if anyone hears my words and does not believe, I do not judge him, for I do not come to judge the world, but to save the world. He who rejects me does not. No, he, he who rejects me and does not receive my words has that which judges him. The word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. John 12, 4, 4 through 48, abridged. As we think about that, we come to the Lord. We're already laid bare before. And so we say, Lord, help us to walk into your light. And if there's something there, you know, search me, try me, as the song says, consume all my darkness. Shine, Jesus, shine. But do we really mean that? 
And that's what sometimes woodshed moments are about. So there was a boy that was getting dressed to go on a date. And he hollers out to his mom, who's in the other room. I guess she was sitting in her chair reading or something. He says, Mom, is, is, is the shirt I have uh, on, uh, is it dirty? Or do I need to get another one? And without, I mean, a hesitation, she says, Son, you know it's probably dirty. Put on a different shirt, a clean shirt. A few moments later, after he's dressed, ready to roll, he walks in his mom. You never even saw the shirt I was talking about. How did you know it was dirty? She said, well, if it had been clean, you would have known it, and there would have been no need to ask me. Remember, if it's doubtful, it's dirty. And in our life, so many times, we have that woodshed moment. It may not be a, when I say woodshed, it's not like I'm just being wore out, but rather that moment where the Lord says, <clears throat> Lord, uh, is, is, this, is this what I want to do? Is, it, is this good? Or, well, is this something that I should not do? Or, or Lord, is, is that movie something I, I don't need to go? Well, if you have to question that, maybe that's your answer. It's not what you need to do. If it's not going to honor the Lord, if it's doubtful, it's dirty. So there are those times we need to come into the light, and, and the Lord's uh, discipline upon us has that effect of educating us and instructing us. When you and I find ourselves assessed by the Lord in our motive and our method, in our attitude, in our action, in our word, and in our work, are you and I willing to change? And are we willing to be changed if and when there might be something amiss? Let's be real, not pretend. But there's a third point. Just as we talked about how woodshed moments are necessary, they're an assessment. But woodshed moments remind us that the Lord God is faithful. He was faithful to his covenant people. He was faithful to the covenant with Abraham. He never abandoned Israel, even when it was north and south. He did not abandon them. Oh, they abandoned him. I mean, the northern kingdom pretty much took the worship of, of Jehovah God. Then they blended it with, I don't know what, uh, when you have, I think, the, the king that came after uh, Solomon, he had greater bow and his son, so Jeroboam, son of Nebat, uh, who took it, and he had an opportunity to do something wonderful and to have God use that and glorify and eventually bring the nation back together, but he decided, no, no, I don't know if I'm going to really agree with that uh, train of reference, so I'm going to go to different, and I'm going to create my own version of the Jewish religion, and that's why basically he's son of nobody at this point, and is held up as the poster boy of bad behavior for all the Old Testament. Just think about that. And so as we think about that, we are reminded that they took the worship of Jehovah God and they perverted it, turned it into something he never intended. And then comes Jezebel and her worship of Baal or Baal. I like the, I love the southern version, Baal, but you actually the mountain, can't pronounce it, Baal. Uh, and the Baalim, which would be the varieties of pagan little gods that they would have worshipped and all the immorality uh, that goes with that. And they blended that. You're going to wonder why Elijah thought, I'm the last man standing. The Lord says, no, I've got several thousand that have not bent the knee, they have not bowed, nor have they kissed the ring or anything else uh, associated with Baal. When we think about that God is faithful. He did not abandon the southern kingdom, even though for 70 long years they were exiles in Babylon. He always preserved a remnant. But he was faithful to them, and he was faithful to discipline them in order to break them of their idolatry and of their immorality. And he's faithful to deal with us both in righteousness, unyielding, unrelenting, but also in grace. He does not give to us as our sins truly deserve. He shows us mercy and grace because the price and the penalty has been paid in Christ. So then the desire and the urge of our heart should be to want to love and trust and obey the Lord. What advantage has the Jew or what is the profit of circumcision? Much in every way. Chiefly because to them were committed the oracles of God for what? If some did not believe, will their unbelief make the faithfulness of God without effect? Certainly not. Indeed, let God be true, but every man a liar, as it is written, that you may be justified in your words and may overcome when you are judged. Romans 3, 1 through 4. And in 2 Timothy 2, 13, Paul writes, if we are faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. 
So God was faithful. So the Hebrew people, uh, both individually in many cases, but in mass, they rejected Jesus as the Messiah at the first coming, and he wept over them. He wept over Jerusalem. Like, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often, how often have I wanted to gather you, kind of, as I paraphrase it, gather you like a mother hen would gather her chickens under her wing, but you were not willing. So your house is left to you, desolate. Until blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Israel to this day has been blinded, but their blindness has allowed you and I to come to faith in Christ. But make no mistake, God has not abandoned Israel. He never will. And he has a remnant still. And the day is coming when uh, that remnant will come to faith in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Maybe sooner than we think. I hope. Part of that discipline is a reminder that there is a God. He does have His will and His way, and He is faithful both to what He promised, He's faithful to His Word, He's faithful to His people, even when discipline is involved. So when the Lord confronts you and I with a woodshed moment of discipline, sometimes we may be tempted to think, oh God, it's just, He's just bearing down so hard on me. Oh God, he's just, he's just wearing me out. Oh God, I, I, he just, he, he's just, I, you know, there's no hope. Well, that discipline does not seem good or fun or pleasant for the moment. No discipline ever does. I, believe it or not, I, I had the belt applied to the seat of education a time or two when I was growing up, dry, dry, whatever, growing up, okay? Whether it took or not, the jury may still be out. But, but with that said, uh, it wasn't pleasant in the moment. It, it wasn't a case, oh, please, I want another I want another spanking. No, I want to get out of that. And what really, really hurt wasn't so much the spanking, because you, you, know, you can't be, I guess, you know, stubborn enough, I'll take it. But when Mama would put me in the room and I had no access to my books or my comic books, oh, I got real repentant then. You know, when you, you don't have access to the things that you enjoy and do. Or when my friends were out, who had come over to play and are outside playing, and all I can do is look out the door and the window. She said, well, it's because you acted up. You acted up in church. You acted up at home. You could be out there with them, but no, you got to be in here. And I told them, well, Charles can't come out to play because, well, he was bad. Now, whether or not, you know, it, it, well, you can be the judge on that. But with that said, when God disciplines us, He's faithful. Even when we are disciplined and it's not pleasant, will we pause to say, Lord, I don't like this, but I trust you. And I know that you're faithful and that you discipline me because first you love me and ultimately you are redemptive. So whatever I'm going through that is, that is a discipline from you is for my good and for your glory. And will we become tender and yield our hearts to Him? Woodshed moments or learning moments. Punishment and correction have a, a, a discipline, and discipline sometimes means information and education. We get the opportunity to learn or to relearn what is expected of us. We, we get to discover or rediscover what has provoked the problem or, or the experience. We have the opportunity by the grace of God to repent. We learn even from the consequences. There have been some things God has allowed me to experience by way of consequences, and yet it's sad when it's self-inflicted. I mean, it really is that, okay, Lord, I, I don't want to go back down that road. Uh, you know, there, there are some uh, proclivities that we have that, that we sometimes lean into uh, things, and, and God takes us to that woodshed, and after that uh, time of punitive uh, experience is over, and we look back in reflection, of the Lord, I, I thank you, because, okay, that's not an area of my life that I need to be going down. That's not an activity. That's not a desire. That's not a whatever that's going to be good or, or wholesome or, or honoring to you. So I don't want to keep going back to the very same thing that I keep getting smacked every time about. So often though, sometimes we get caught up like Israel in that same pattern. We, we're, we're sorry because we want the, the punishment to be ended, but are we truly, genuinely sorry that we did what we did? We have the opportunity to learn. Here's what we did. Here's how God disciplined us so that we won't want to do that same thing again. Sometimes our consequences, they can be temporal. 
you know, I mean, not a lasting thing. Or sometimes they may be life and career altering. But we learn because God is in the redeeming and we purpose in business. The goodness of God leads you to repentance. Romans 2.4 He's shown you, O man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Micah 6.8 So when you and I experience uh, the woodshed moment from the Lord, are we willing to be confronted? Sometimes we don't like to be confronted. We don't like to be told you're wrong. All of us are like that. Sometimes I can bristle but it's when we are willing to be confronted, we're willing to be critiqued or criticized, we're willing to uh, be humbled and corrected so that we learn. And the big question is, am I teachable? Are you teachable? Because humility allows us to be teachable and that we learn some amazing things. And I don't say that we should always seek the discipline of God, but there's something holy and healthy to be learned. Israel eventually got the message. Now they did a whole lot of other stuff that was bad later on, but they weren't worshiping Baal anymore at that point. Woodshed moments can become watershed moments. Watershed is a, it's a turning point. It's that moment that changes the direction of an activity or situation, a, a dividing line for which things will never ever be the same. Uh, according to experts, it was about, uh, in fact, where originally a geographical term were an area where water sources drain either to a single river or over some type of ridge in which they divert into two separate rivers. Either way, it is a dividing line, a turning point. And when there's recognition of sin and failure, and that godly sorrow that is produced by the Holy Spirit that is working in our conscience as a, as a saved person, that we're able to say, Lord, I agree with you. I'm wrong. I ask for your forgiveness. Help me to change my ways on that. And that grace leads us to that right type of change so that we begin to think, feel, speak, and act differently. And change that occurs and remains in place and is consistent that brings about greater fruit. That is a beautiful thing. See that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Ephesians 5. Are you and I willing to take that moment where we may have, in the past, and we look back at it and say, yeah, Lord, that was a time, that was a woodshed. Or something that may occur now or in the future when the Lord says, you be at the woodshed now. We've got... We've got a learning curve that we need to talk about. Are we willing to say, Lord, I, no, I don't like the, the woodshed, but if it will transform me into who you want me to be, then I'm willing to receive it. I'm willing to trust you for it. I'm willing to trust that you will take what might be a negative up front and transform it into something that becomes beautiful and beneficial so that I'm a different person and a better person than what I currently am? Are we willing to take that woodshed moment from the Lord and trust Him to turn it into a watershed moment so we look back and say, yeah, there's where God intervened. He got in my face with it and would not let me go any further. And because I yielded to Him, He sent me in a different direction, a better direction, so that not only was I blessed, but I was able to bless others. I think about opportunities before I came here. I thought, oh, this must be God's will. This is God's open door. Uh, this is the direction God wants me to go, and every door closed. Bam, bam, bam. Um, you know, and I'm like, okay. <laughs> and then I had to remember a prayer that I prayed way back in 1996. Lord, whatever you want, anytime, any place, Anywhere, whatever capacity, the answer is yes, even if I don't know the question. When I started praying like that, I got to thinking, Lord, I am so thankful that you shut those doors. I'm so thankful that, that those doors sometimes were slammed in my face because sometimes I don't get the message, so it takes a little bit drastic action there. So that, God, I was willing to hear you and trust you so that when you opened the right door, you led me where I needed to be, and I am grateful and thankful to be here at Chunky Baptist Church. Make no mistake about that. That those moments that were woodsheds became watershed moments. Write them down because we can thank Him for His grace 
in the woodshed because he's redemptive and we can thank him for his grace. In that woodshed, we look back, oh God, thank you. That what I thought was a uh, just <laughs> an ugly experience actually became a turning point in my life. As we continue on through Judges, we'll be looking at uh, some other elements and some of that pattern, that cycle on again. Uh, a spiritual pathology report. Uh, we'll be talking about that. And then eventually we'll start looking at some of the, the major and the minor Judges. Uh, so there's so much to learn from that period of time that I believe is relevant for our time tonight. But as we stand and sing our hymn of invitation, I believe it is, I surrender all. Sing it like you mean it. The altar's open. Will you surrender to the Lord? Are you willing to trust Him and thank Him for the woodshed and the watershed that He would have you to experience? You come.